One of the most common pieces of advice you've probably heard as a creator is to niche down. But what if you have multiple interests, passions and ideas? If this sounds familiar, it means you're a multi-potentialite. It's very, very difficult to find marketing, business, creator advice for multi-potentialites, simply because Google, all the videos, everything, all the podcasts tend to be neurotypical advice. Jake McNeil helps multi-potentialites to leverage their creativity and divergent thinking. In today's episode, he'll show you how to find success as a multi-passionate creator. The psychological definition of a multi-potentialite is somebody with multiple creative and or academic talents but basically they're divergent thinkers so there's two types of people in the world there's neurotypicals who are convergent thinkers so five plus five equals ten that's convergent thinking there's only one possible answer and multipotentialites are divergent thinkers so we say how many different numbers can we add together to make ten which means we come up with lots and lots of different answers which is why we're so creative i find it really interesting then that a lot of creatives i meet are multipotentialites or multi-passionate but a lot of the advice that we see out there in the creative world is to niche down. So why is that such common advice we receive as creatives? Well, it's just because the, we live in a specialist society. So by specialist society, I mean that the vast majority of people on the planet are neurotypicals. So they're specialists. So they can only focus, uh, they can focus on, pick one thing and focus on it, whereas we can't, right? So all the advice out there uh, is from created by neurotypicals for other neurotypicals, which is basically to niche down. So that's why it's such it's so commonplace. It's very very difficult to find uh, marketing, business, creator advice for multipotentialites, simply because uh, Google, all the videos, everything, all the podcasts tend to be neurotypical advice. So how do we approach this then? Like, how do we kind of figure out who our audience are and? what our corner of the internet is if we're not niching down like what is the alternative to that well the alternative to niching down is to niche up so if you think of niching down niching down is what specialists do now why do specialists niche down well because they want to stand out why do they want to stand out because all the markets are saturated why are all the markets saturated because everyone's copying each other one person is successful then everybody else copies it right so really the point of niching down from a specialist point of view is so they can be different so they can stand out Whereas multi-potentialites or multi-passionates, we're different by default, right? So instead of niching down, we must niche up. We must take all our various different skills and stack them on top of each other. So that way we can be different and stand out. Yeah, that makes sense. I like that. And what's the best way to go about that in a way where, because I mean, so a lot of advice that I get is work out who your audience are. But I, I almost struggle with that because I'm like, how do I figure out who my audience is if I almost don't even know who I am as a creator because I'm, I'm doing all these different things. So what's the best way of overcoming that? Well, uh, this is, again, very, very sort of common sort of neurotypical advice would be yeah. to create four marketing personas. And this is where we create imaginary people out of the sky and we'll call them, say, Emily and say maybe she's 32 and da, 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 da. And for us, it's, this feels really inauthentic and it just doesn't make any sense. We can't wrap our heads around this. So instead of looking outside in, in other words, making up fake marketing personas, we should look within. So really what we're trying to do is we should, our, our ideal clients are actually the younger versions of ourselves. So when I do one-to-one sessions with clients, I get them to name their fears, their hopes, their aspirations, their obstacles. And a hundred times out of a hundred, they will actually talk about their own fears, their own hopes, their own aspirations. So in a, in a weird way, well, not a weird way, in a really nice, authentic way, we are indeed our own uh, ideal clients. So we should look within because what we're trying to do is help the younger version of ourselves. So that's how we, that's how we find our clients. That makes a lot of sense. I feel like that's kind of what I've been doing without actually realizing it so far on my creator journey um so that's like one of the big problems I face as a multi-passionate person but what are some of the other problems you see multi-potentialites face on their creator journey so many it's so cruel we (laughs) the most creative uh, and innovative people on the planet uh which we we absolutely are by the way uh we have the best problem solving skills on the planet but we have a huge fear of putting ourselves out there so perfectionism uh fear of rejection um fear of the unknown i mean pretty much any fear we have it and that's because we're highly sensitive people a lot a lot of multi-potentialites multi-passions um identify as empaths so basically the the what makes us so creative is our deep emotional world however it's that also that deep emotional world that is, is the struggle for putting ourselves out there and how would you what do you recommend to your clients who are struggling with perfectionism in their creative process how do they overcome that 
Well, perfectionism is not the uh, desire to be perfect. Perfectionism is actually the avoidance of failure, right? So, and that comes from all the, all the perfectionistic uh, uh, research points to the fact that there are feelings of not being good enough. So really perfectionism is a manifestation of our hiding the fact that we don't feel good enough, okay? So the problem with perfectionism is indeed the avoidance of failure. So instead of, um, when we start projects, we in, we invest so much of our in, in a bid to avoid failure, we actually, it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy we, because we put so much time, effort and energy into avoiding failure. We actually create the failure because we overthink the shit out of everything and then mm. it all comes tumbling down. So what I say to clients and I've listened, by the way, I have had so, I've had failed podcasts, YouTube channels. <laughs> I mean, you name it. I failed so many times. It's unbelievable. Uh, and the reason for that was that let's say I wanted to start a podcast, which is, I failed twice at, right? So I said, okay, I'm going to make this the best podcast in the world, right? So I would go and buy a course in it. I'd read books in it. I would read blogs in it. I'd, I'd listen to other podcasts about having successful podcasts. And by the time I came to create my own podcast, I'd overthought it so much that it just, yeah, it, it was paralyzing for me. So what I came up with uh, is basically I encourage clients to do tiny, messy experiments. So for example, when I started my TikTok channel, I didn't say, I'm going to make this the best TikTok channel in the world ever. I said, I'm going to post 30 videos for 30 days as an experiment uh, on TikTok. And if it works, I'll, ca I'll continue. And if it doesn't, I'll stop. And it worked. And it, it's done really well. I've got a big audience there. When I started my uh, newsletter, I didn't say, I'm going to make this the best newsletter in the planet. What I said is, I'm going to do four articles in, uh, over four weeks. And if I like it, I can continue. And if I don't, I don't. So mm -hmm. I treat everything as an experiment. So the, some experiments work and some experiments don't. And what I'm doing by that is I'm removing my um, identity uh, uh, from the success or failure of a project and putting it onto an experiment. So the experiment works or the experiment fails and that removes the identity and the pressure for me, which allows me to perform at my best. I, I like that approach. I think it's a little bit more relaxed and definitely takes the pressure off. Um, yeah. But how do you decide how long your experiments should run? So say, so for example, I, I love making YouTube videos. I really enjoy it. So that experiment passed, but say if I've been doing it for a really long time, I've not seen the growth that I want to, at what point should I think, okay, maybe it's time to pivot. Maybe it's time. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm, uh, maybe well, I'm not I, initially, right. Yeah, no, I am sorry. So initially it's, um, I, I say, uh, do to try it for 30 days. At the, after the end of 30 days, you know whether you like something or not, and then you can progress. Um, I think, if you, if you, for example, my, my, my uh, newsletter, it's just under 10,000 subscribers now. Uh, but for the first, well, for the first eight months, I wrote to 200 people. Now that was, I had no growth in it whatsoever. I mean, it, it, by all accounts, I should have just, uh, I should just stopped doing it. However, it, the, it was a creative outlet for me that allowed me to process my emotions, to articulate my thoughts, to be able to connect with just the, the 200 people. Right. And, uh, the more I did that, the more I connected with people and, the, and the, the, the more it grew. So I think if YouTube is something you really, really enjoy, if it's something that allows you to process your emotions, uh, to articulate your thoughts, which is really important for us, because if we don't process mm -hmm. our emotions, we sweep them under the carpet, they overspill, we get frustrated, we get burnt out, and all those lovely things that happen to creative people. So if, if you are really enjoying it as, as a process, do it for yourself and not worry about the audience. And over time, it will work. Mm. And let's let's touch on burnout because is that something mm. that you see as something really common amongst very creative people? Every single client, <laughs> and, <laughs> and myself, by the way, I, I have a, I'm a serial burnouter. Uh, uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, no, I, I see it all the time, and the, the the main reason for it is that we're not processing our emotions uh, uh, in a particular way. The other reason is that we're, you know, we, we're brought up in a neurotypical society. The social programming is that we should go take a safe job, take the safe mm. path, go for the wage. And we can do that, but we end up burning out because we're not living uh, an unconventional life or business that is true to ourselves. OK, so we're basically essentially we're masking. We're, we're pretending to be something we're not in order to fill the social um, programming and the expectations of others that guarantee leads us to burnout sooner or later. Uh, the other thing is, is that we're not processing our emotions. We don't have some sort of creative outlet that allows us to process how we feel um, and indeed articulate our thoughts. So these are the, these are the common things, but literally every single client, I, I, um, I, I'm yet to meet a creative that doesn't have multiple burnouts for, the mm. for, for a couple of the reasons I've just mentioned, yeah. But how do you prevent that from happening? So for example, you said you know, we kind of have to have the typical job. And so for a creator who loves what they do, but they're maybe not making a 
a full-time income on it and they need to have that stability of that job how can they then manage that creative passion that they have with you know the stability that they kind of need as well yeah, it's it's very very difficult. Um, and again, I've exp- uh, I've I've seen this with both personally and with my clients. You know, over thirty years. So uh, yeah, I mean, uh, so so what can one do? Uh, well, first of all, one has to be able to process their emotions. So let, let me explain what I mean. So if you read an article of, uh, from me about perfectionism, it's because I feel perfectionistic. So I'm taking my my perfectionism, I'm processing it, and I'm writing an article to solve my problem, but equally to help the, uh, my clients because they're the younger version of me and have the same problems. If you see a video on TikTok about me about productivity, it's because I'm feeling unproductive. So I'm, I, I, I'm, I have a creative outlet to be able to process my emotions. Now, you don't have to do this in public. You can do this with journaling. There's various different uh, other methods. Uh, uh, the morning pages is a very common one, for example. So that's one side of it, being able to process emotions and articulate our thoughts. The other side in terms of um, uh, uh, how having to do a stable job is just to treat it as exactly like a job, but put all your effort uh, and creative passion into a creative outlet, which mm. helps balance it a bit better. Uh, but really it's about being authentic. Uh, creativity is an act of authenticity, right? If you think about yeah. it, when we get in creative creative flow it's the only time we're not judging ourselves so we're not going oh is this good enough am i good enough blah 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 uh and uh there's no expectation oh is this video going to go viral or is this going to get me a a client when we're in flow state it's just between us and our our creativity it's just flowing out of us right so it's about getting into that state as often as possible because that is happiness that's bliss that's that's where we want to be really and how do you then cope with uh... I guess expectations of others. So say if you have built an audience and you know, you've know you been really creative up, at that, up until that point and then you've monetized and now you've got sponsors to think about and there's almost this change in mindset where now your creativity is not just an outlet, it's also your career. Yeah. How do you cope with that? That is very difficult. It's something I'm actually wrestling with right now. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, so... Uh, I, 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 well, first of all, I think it goes back to processing emotions. Da, 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 da. Once sponsors get involved, uh, then it can dictate you in a journey. Now, uh, I've turned down, um, I mean, I don't have a huge, massive audience on uh, on TikTok, but 135,000, something like that. So I get quite, quite a lot of offers of sponsors I, that I don't take because it takes me down, whilst the money would be nice, it takes me down a route I don't want to go creatively. And for me, mm-hmm. the, the, the number one priority is, for, is to be my true creative self. Uh, and if I can align that with sponsors, then we're in a great space. And if I can't, yeah. then I have to pass on it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I find it interesting that you're actually, you know, on TikTok and you have the newsletter because something I struggle with is this pressure almost to be on every single platform. So I'm not even struggling with what am I talking about? I'm also struggling with where do I talk about it? Yeah. How how do multi-potentialites figure out where best to use their creativity? Well, um, I think it depends on the person, but I, I recommend clients stick to two channels. So we have a discovery channel, which could be TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, uh, mm-hmm. and then we have a, a relationship building. Well, neurotypicals call it a nurturing channel, but it just sounds so manipulative. I hate it. So <laughs> a relationship building channel, which is usually an email list or a Discord channel, something along those lines. And I, I believe that that's what we should focus on initially. So that's what I did. Uh, I, I started off with my blog or my newsletter, and then I built a, a TikTok channel, which then sort of redirects into that. And now that I've got, uh, well, now, now that I've built a, a, a fairly big personal brand on uh, TikTok, I can then go out and so do LinkedIn or maybe Twitter. But my advice is not to spread yourself too thin because it's just too overwhelming. There's too many mm. algorithms. There's too much expectation. 100%. And apart from anything else, we flip flop. So should I be doing Twitter today or should I be doing TikTok or should I be doing YouTube or blah, 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 blah. And we end up spinning in circles and getting nowhere. Yeah. And do you ever find that, so even if you have these platforms you kind of know what you're talking about but you have so many other ideas that you want to start on so you know you might want to be building like digital products or like a course or or something and I know that you said that you know we can take an experimental approach but I feel like those things are a little bit more high effort so how do you kind of deal with the overwhelm of like I have so many ideas or ways I want to monetize this where do I start? Well, wow, great question. So, I mean, basically it's all about purpose, isn't it? So um, for me, I'm helping the younger version of myself. So it's helping multi-potentialites fulfill their creative potential. Okay. So that's, that's, that's a very sort of like zoomed out view. So 
uh, I get ideas all the time, right? Uh, not always related to this, right? I love sausages. I don't know why. I just always love sausages. And I just know that I could make championship winning sausages because you know how we're good at <laughs> lots of different things, right? Yeah. I know that I could go to all the, go, go to the farms, get the best beet, get the best herbs and spices and da, da, da. So I have to say to myself, does making championship winning sausages, does that get me closer to helping multi-potentialites fulfill their creative potential or further away? So I would say that goes further away. It might be a nice right. thing to do. So I, I do it like that. In terms of actually helping them, I think, okay, what is the quickest, most simplistic way that I can help somebody because here's the thing right and you, you I'm sure you'll recognize this and, and any other multi-potentialites or multi-passionates listening to this will also recognize this we are idea generating machines okay now we are dopamine deficient uh now that is true but we get waves of dopamine so we can get dopamine um overdoses so let me explain what I mean by that so let's say you know these I use an allergy or a metaphor of you know those tiny little cute houses you get so we have this idea and we think okay I'm going to design and build one of those tiny little cute houses so we have that idea and then our dopamine starts pumping and it goes oh well we should add another floor and then another floor then the helicopter pad and then we should add the gym and then we should add the car park and before you know it this tiny little uh, cute little house that we're going to design is turned into the Empire State building and this is all fueled by our dopamine and then our dopamine crashes and we're going oh my god this idea is now so overwhelming where do we even start mm -hmm. does that sound familiar yeah 100 yeah uh, and basically that's what it is this is this is a, a dopamine overdose so when we're going well which idea do we do basically what we have to do is we have to simplify 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 uh we struggle with prioritization we struggle with uh, uh deciding what should be the first so what i always do is i start with the simple ideas first what is the idea that i can execute really quickly so maybe that's like a pdf or maybe that's like a 60 minute course or maybe that's one-to-ones whatever the situation is i simplify it and then i grow it incrementally from there mm -hmm. and what about so i mean this happened to me really recently i was just not in the mood to create at all like i think i went yeah. into a creative rut i don't know why I, and I, I just could not create for like at least a couple of months. So I took time off of YouTube. Like, how do you get out of that creative rut? So when the ideas just suddenly stop flowing? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm that way with TikTok at the moment. So I'm, I'm very, I've got a love-hate relationship with TikTok. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas um, just because creating videos, I enjoy creating videos, they're fun. But because it's a daily thing, you just run out yeah. of ideas and you feel like you're repeating yourself. Yeah. Um, so I go through this, so I'm going through it right now, and I just take a break from it. Uh, the one constant that I have that I never get bored of is writing. So okay. for me, that, that is my, um, that, 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 that's my true creativity. So I can keep writing, no problems. And because I don't write every day, so I'm not on Twitter, um, I basically write uh, on Substack. So I, I write currently tw uh, uh, twice a week, right? So I do like two 1500 word uh, essays per week. And that for me, uh, keeps me going. Um, I would encourage you, uh, I don't know. Do you, do you, do you enjoy writing? Yes, definitely. Do you, do you have a, do you have a newsletter? I do, but I'm not as consistent with it as I am with okay. YouTube. I always prioritize YouTube over the newsletter. And, 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 and why, why do you think that is? I just enjoy YouTube a lot more, I guess. I, I really enjoy the video editing process. Um, uh -huh. And I put a lot into writing the scripts. So I almost feel like when I've written a YouTube script, I'm almost like exhausted from writing. And then I just okay. don't put that same time into the, the newsletter. So newsletter is almost like an afterthought sometimes. But I also I think it's that. because I need to probably change my newsletter because it's too similar to what I do on YouTube. And I feel like it needs to be a little bit different. So I've got a bit more of an interest for it. I feel okay. like I've already done it. What I would do in that case, I would repurpose, you know, the script that you're writing out for, yeah. for YouTube, I would actually repurpose that and turn that into a, 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 a newsletter article. Oh, interesting. So actually, that's a really interesting thought because I've, I mean, I know all about repurposing and I, I get, I get it, but I've always thought, oh, it's not that creative or like, you know, my audience is going to get <laughs> sick of seeing the same thing. So like, what is your, what's your approach to repurposing? Uh, well, I, I, I understand. I feel the same. Um, I feel like well, everything I have to create, it has to be the most, um, most creative, original thing in the world ever, yeah. right? But it's just not practical. So um, I, I, don't, I don't have a problem repurposing. The, the reality of it is, is that, I mean, we know from a marketing perspective that it, somebody has to hear a message seven times before they actually buy something on average. Um, mm. So we get, we get bored of our message a lot quicker uh, 
uh, than our audience get bored of our message. But basically, I mean, I, I, I've got clients who have, are very, very sort of time poor. Uh, they're going viral on TikTok um, and I get them to take their TikTok scripts and I get them to turn them into sub, sub stacks. Now they will embellish them and they will change them. They'll use it as a, uh, I don't know, like a, a, like a diving off point and then sort of take it on a different journey. So they do feel that it's, that it's new and creative and original, but it, it's right. taking uh, the, the, the core ideas of what they've already created elsewhere. So something that I mean, I always see in the creator economy, people talking about systems and habits yeah. and routines. Do you have that to kind of ensure that you are being creative, but then also hitting consistency? Yeah, I mean, I, I time block. So um, I, I've got a very, very tight schedule. Um, I mean, I'm neurodivergent, so uh, I, I have problems with productivity, uh, but Basically, over the years, over the decades, I've built a bunch of systems. So I, I use time blocking uh, and habit stacking, which are which are two common, pretty common things in um, the neurodivergent, multi-potentialite world. But so how do you basically, structure that? Well, I structure. I, I, have, I basically from eight till ten, I write. From ten to twelve, I do video. Twelve to half twelve, I have my lunch. Twelve to, <laughs> to one o'clock sounds so boring, doesn't it? Twelve, <laughs> 12 to one o'clock, I go for my walk. Uh, I, I come back. Half one's my first client. I have, I have three clients a day. One one early afternoon, one late afternoon, um, uh, and then have my dinner, and then I have one in the evening because oh, wow. pretty much all my, all my clients are uh, US based or ninety nine percent US based. Fine. So uh, yeah, basically that's how I do it. Uh, uh, so there's three things there. So three things I love doing. Uh, one is writing. I just love writing. I could write all day, no problems. Uh, two, uh, creating videos. Now, if I'm not creating videos, I'm building a course or whatever, right? I'm doing some sort of form of creativity. Uh, yeah. And one-to-ones, I love one-to-ones because I love helping people solve their problems, right? So yeah. so basically, there's, there's three, three things. Um, and because they're things I love doing, I don't have, uh, I don't suffer from procrastination. However, as my accountant will testify to, anything to do with like tax or VAT <laughs> or anything boring whatsoever, then I mean, I, yeah, I, I'm just the world's worst. I'm your typical neurodivergent. Everything's left to the last minute. But the yeah. point is, is I, I've designed a unconventional life and business, which is basically stacking all the things I love doing, squeezing as much as that into it and, and, and leveraging that to build my business and help other people do the same. Yeah. And I'm interested with how have you actually found your clients? Because I mean, something else that I mean, I've seen creative people struggle with is not wanting to come across as too salesy. They want to be more of the artist versus the business person. So how do you find that balance and how do you bring people into your business organically? Yeah, so there's, I think there's two ways to market to people, right? There's the specialist way, the neurotypical way, which is to manipulate people, and that's using like persuasion, psychological tactics, you know, fake marketing personas, agitating insecurities, blah 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 blah. So that's one way of doing it. The other, so there's that's the manipulation, or there's resonating. So what I do is I. I basically help the younger version of myself. So I've already faced the same problems and challenges and still do that my clients do. So what mm-hmm. I do is I uh, share my stories with vulnerability um, and I help clients feel seen and heard. Now, by them feeling seen and heard, then I in turn feel seen and heard, feel seen and, heard and that's what uh, they call radical acceptance, right? So basically people um, will watch my content or read my content and they, they instantly know that I understand their brains because they have the same challenges or brains, you know, as, as yeah. I do. And as a result of that, if I can, uh, th- then people naturally come to me. I don't have to be salesy at all. I just have to resonate with people. And uh, once people know that I truly, truly understand their brain and understand what their problems are, and I can, I can show solutions to overcome said problems and challenges, then people just get in contact with me. Mm, I love that. I love how um, organic it is and how... Yeah. Yeah, authentic it is to you because you're thinking yeah. about your younger self, so you know everything should resonate yeah. with them. Um, I'm going to end with a quick fire round now. So it's the same okay. questions that I ask every creator that comes on air, starting with, "What's your favourite thing about being a creator?" Uh, writing, uh, connecting with people, being authentic, because uh, creativity is our authenticity. Mm, love that. And what's something that gives you the most inspiration for what you create? uh my own brain my own fuck ups <laughs> basically <laughs> so so basically that. i'm just all, all i'm doing is i'm solving my own problems knowing that it's also solving the problems of of my audience who are the younger version of me yeah and what's a tool that helps you as a creator uh my divergent thinking brain there you go i like that yeah <laughs> um and what something that helps you with your creator work life balance 
Uh, well, I, I I need to find that. I need to find that uh, because oh, really? I do work. I, oh, I work too much. I work too much. Uh, I, I I guess my daughter. I love my family. My uh, my daughter is only she's just turned nine years old, and Aww. I just love I love spending time with them. It's my favorite thing. And the great thing about being a, a creator and you know helping other people is that. Uh, I don't have to, I don't sit, I, when I used to work in the music industry, sorry, I know this is, I know this is uh, no, a it's qu- fine. quick fire, but when <laughs> I used to work in the music industry, I was constantly worried about ticket sales, about getting the bands on Radio One or, you know, all these kind of things. And uh, I used to spend all my time, even with my family, I, I was with them physically, but I used to be thinking about problems mm. in the music industry, right? And I, I hated that, right? So, uh, so now I, I get to spend time with my family and just spend it with them and enjoy our time and just play with my daughter. I love that. That's so nice. Yeah, you get to be more present with them, which is really good. Yeah, precisely. Um, what what advice do you have for other creators? Uh, be yourself. Uh, live the, live the life that is true to yourself. Right, your creative life that's true to yourself, and know what others expect you to do. Others are going to expect you to take that job. I don't know, an accountancy or a legal job, whatever. But the reality is, AI is going to it's completely changing the landscape and I think it's a positive thing because it's going to force people out of their comfort zones so my my mm. uh, advice to them is to just yeah follow your curiosity uh, and and be your true creative self I like that I like how different that perspective is as well with AI so amazing yeah. thank you so much Jake I feel like this is really helpful and really reassuring as well for me and I'm sure a lot of people who are multi-potentialites to listen to so thank you no well thank you so much it's been it's been a great pleasure and uh, I really appreciate the opportunity You can find Jake on TikTok, his newsletter, and his website, Creative Hackers. And if you are a creator and you're working with sponsors, check out Passion Fruit. We help you to streamline your entire workflow so you can focus on your creativity.